I think all sanders are all pretty good. There's no really, really bad sanders. I think it's just it's the user that makes the difference. So if, you, if you're brand conscious and you want to buy a certain brand, that's great. If you just want a sander that'll do the job, then almost any sander will do as long as you're buying the right sandpaper and you're using it correctly. Those are the two most important things about sandpaper. And I often say it about table saws. I say, you know, you, you can buy any circular saw you like as long as you have a good blade. So if you have an average sander and you have great sandpaper, and you have good dust extraction, and you use it correctly, you will get fantastic results. There's not any real reason to go out and buy a 20,000 Rand sander. And believe me, there are sanders out there that cost that kind of money. The purpose of this video is to spend time with you guys and demystify this whole thing called sanding, because it's not that complicated. If we break it down into simple parts, you'll see that it is actually something that anyone can do well. You know, it's the kind of thing that people think, well, let's just give it to some guy to do and he can do the sanding because we don't want to do it. I've always said that a bad job finished well will sell and a good job finished badly won't. And that just speaks to the truth about how people see furniture. It's the thing where you have to take care of yourself. It's the last thing that happens before you deliver the piece of work to your customer or before you put on finish. So you really want to get that part right. And there are a couple of tips and tricks that I'll show you during the course of this video that will really, really help you get a much better finish. And when I say finish, what you want to do is get your project ready for applying a finish coat on. And if you do sanding poorly, what will happen is that the, the finish will show up all your bad work in an instant. And it's heartbreaking when you spend all this time sanding and then you put finish on and you see scratch marks everywhere. So you've got to get that part right. So we're going to spend some time just talking about the basics, we're going to get into depth on some of the things, but stick around. I hope you guys learn as much as what I'm going to try and teach you. But at the end of the day, remember sanding isn't that bad if you break it down into bite-sized chunks. Okay, so let's get started. Let's begin with a very, very basic concept of sanding. What exactly is sanding? So sanding really is just the removal of material to try and gain some sort of a result. Now, sometimes the result you're looking for isn't always smooth. Sometimes you're sanding things just to remove material and you don't care about the finish. Or sometimes sanding is about trying to get that glassy finish on something. So it depends on what you want to achieve. But there is almost always a tool for it. There's almost always a technique for it. And if you have the patience to learn these things, you will almost always get a fantastic result. Let's talk a little bit about sanders. In front of me there is an array of sanders. Now you have to ask yourself how many sanders exactly do you need? Well you don't need a lot of sanders but more than one sander is probably a good idea and the reason for that is that a lot of sanders are different from the other sanders. So there are some sanders that do one thing and some sanders that do another thing and some sanders that do many things. But let's break it down into the kinds of sanders that there are on the market. Sanders work in one of several different ways. One of the most basic kinds of sanders is called a rotary sander. Now there's a sander where the disc simply spins around and around and around and around. So it doesn't do anything fancy, it just goes around and around. Here mm -hmm. is an example of a rotary sander. This happens to be a pneumatic sander, so it works on air, so it's an air compressor. And all this, all this one does is he spins around in circles. He doesn't do anything fancy, he doesn't oscillate, he doesn't do anything other than just go around in circles. That's good for removal of material. It's great to remove material quickly, but what you will get in almost every grid of sandpaper that you have is a circular scratch pattern. So if you stick in one area too long, you will develop a scratch pattern on your wood that is circular. Then they get what they call a random orbital sander. The best way to describe it is, to, is to, if you look at my hand, instead of it just going around and around, there's actually an elliptical bearing in the middle of the sander. So it actually goes up and down and around and around. In other words, it actually develops a far more random scratch pattern. Again, the nice thing about random orbital sanders is that they remove material very, very quickly, but they require some skill to use, and I'll cover that territory in a minute. And then finally, probably the, the sander that the least people really know about is a sander called a finish sander. And this sander doesn't go around and around, or it doesn't oscillate, it doesn't go in a random orbital pattern. All it does is go forwards and backwards in one motion. So when you're sanding with the grain, this is as if you are sanding by hand, but it's a very short, very straight stroke. In other words, 
it actually gives you a very, very good finish. So this is a finished sander. That's a random orbital sander. These are both random orbital sanders. The, most, the sander that most people tend to know about is a thing called a mouse sander, and it's just a little sander that can get into corners and what have you. These are very, very popular for a DIY kind of a market. So if you're looking for a sander that can do just about everything, one of these little uh, mouse sanders are fantastic. I'm gonna take you guys through some of the sanders that I use every single day, what I like about them, what I don't like about them, and then we're gonna get into sandpaper and sanding in general. Let's start at the very, very beginning. Again, I said, this is just like a normal, uh, an orbital sander. These random orbital sanders all have something in common. They have a disc that spins and it also oscillates randomly. But you'll notice that there are these holes in the base. If you can see, there are all these holes over here. Now, what that does, it allows you to use sanding pads that have the holes in them. And because they have the holes in them, there's a little fan at the in, in the bottom here that sucks the dust up into the machine and into the little dust bag or into the dust extractor if you happen to attach a dust extractor. But this will give you a much better finish because you're removing the dust particles off the surface before they in turn help to re-scratch the surface. The best sanders are the ones where you have dust extraction. Now, just a little bit about dust extraction is that if you can, wherever possible, use dust extraction because A, it's not great to breathe dust all day long, it's bad for you. And B, you get a far better result if your dust extraction is actually working well. The stuff goes out of the air, it's out of the way, you're sanding with sandpaper on wood and you're not getting the particles and dust in the way and what have you. So your, your scratch pattern is, is far, far better. Okay, so this one over here is what they call a hook and loop or a Velcro pad. So you can attach your sanding pad using Velcro onto this over here, and I find that to be the most convenient. Some sanders, of course, don't have that, and they have sort of clip-on feet. So if I take this one here, I can remove this. This is a sheet sander, and I can remove the, sander, uh, the sanding paper by simply unclipping it and clipping it back into this holding mechanism over here. So this sander is actually also a random orbital sander. It's a slightly bigger footprint, so it's a bigger one. I can cover more territory with it, and it's a really comfortable, good sander to use. Notice it also has dust extraction, and as far as I'm concerned, every, every machine should have dust extraction. All the way up to what is, for me, the top of the pops. So this over here is a, uh, is a Festool Rotex sander. This, in my view, is the best sander on the planet. Um, they're not cheap, but when you're doing lots and lots of sanding and you have a very good dust extraction system, it's unbelievably efficient. Now, in my business, efficiency is everything. I can't spend too much time sanding things. I need to get it sanded properly, but I need to get stuff in and out. So for me, it's all about efficiency, so this machine makes total sense for me. If you're a hobbyist or a DIY person and you have some time, any of these other machines are, are perfectly fine. Okay, so let's go back to the basics on, on what sanding is and how it works. I have here a representation of what the surface of some wood would look like under a microscope. So if you magnify the surface of a piece of wood by a heck of a lot, what you'll see is something like this. You'll actually see sort of hills and valleys. When you're talking about sandpaper, almost always one of the first things people ask is, what is the deal with grits? So you get sanding paper that starts at 40 grit, goes all the way up to 320 grit, 400 grit, 500 grit. In fact, I've seen as much as 2,000 grits and even more sometimes. The higher the number, the finer the grit. And what is the grit? Well, the grit is actually calculated by the number of particles that are attached to the paper per square inch. I think it's inch. 80 means 80 particles per inch. 40 means 40 particles per square inch or whatever it may be. The smaller the number, the bigger the particles. The higher the number, the smaller the particles and the closer, closer together they're packed which gives you a much smoother sanding or abrasive surface. And remember, that's exactly what sanding paper is. It's an abrasive. When we are using paper as an abrasive, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to knock these guys off here. I mean, we're trying to create a smooth surface. So if that's the bottom and these are the bottoms of the, the valleys, ultimately, we want to sand right down to this line here. Okay, And we have to get rid of this. This is what we've got to get rid of. Now, what happens is if we start using sandpaper where the grit is too high, in other words, if we start with 180 grit sandpaper, the little particles that are attached to our paper are, let's say, they're about so big. Now, if they're that big, it's impossible for them to be able to remove something as big as this because it's not possible. So if we take a 40 grit piece of paper, then our grit there 
is about the same size maybe as those things. So we can much, much more easily remove the, the hills out of the equation. If I was just to use small sandpaper or a higher grit sandpaper, all that would happen is that we would chop the tops off these, these hills here. And we might think it feels smooth because the dust is all gone to go and sit in these valleys here like that. And we might be fooled and think it's all smooth until we blow it off, wipe stuff down with, with mineral spirits. And then we look and see, hang on, well, this is actually, I'm seeing scratch marks everywhere because we haven't, what they say, worked through the grits. Now, what does that mean, working through the grits? It means that it makes the most amount of sense to start with paper that has the bigger particles on, so 40, 60, 80 grit paper, start with that, and then you've got to work through the grits. In other words, you shouldn't ever cheat and skip. You shouldn't go 80 grit, 180 grit, 320 grit, thank you for playing. You actually have to work your way through it. So you need to spend some time with 80 grit sandpaper or 60 grit sandpaper, then 80 grit sandpaper, then 120, then 150 or 180, then 220, and maybe then 320. Now, very few times have I ever needed to go past sort of 220 or even 320. I mean, that's fairly extreme and that's very, very smooth stuff. But sometimes we do. It doesn't really make much sense to go finer than that unless you are sanding something that you're going to be spraying high gloss or you're doing a metal work or something like that. But generally speaking, 220 grit or 320 grit is perfectly fine. So working through the grits means that you slowly start taking off the hills and work your way down so that ultimately you get your, you get your smooth surface. So that's just the concept you need to get your heads around. And the beautiful part about working through the grits is that you don't have to spend hours and hours on every grit. In fact, it actually is faster to sand a piece of wood by going through the grits um, and using the, each grit for maybe a minute and going through five grits. It'll take you five minutes to get an area smooth as opposed to trying to bash it down with a grit that's too high and you'll sand for 10, 15, 20 minutes and you'll feel like you're going nowhere. And every time you clean it off to see if you've got scratch marks, you still do because you haven't actually managed to knock off the tops of these hills effectively enough. The whole lesson here is work through your grits. Go start at the beginning, go with 60 or 80, go to 120, go to 150 or 180, go to 220 and then 320, work your way through the grits, sand effectively and efficiently, and I'll show you this, the technique involved in a minute. And, and that way you tend to get a far, far better finish. Also pro tip, if you've got like headphones and music, get some of that because sanding is boring no matter what anyone says. It's got to be done, but it's boring, so you may as well make it fun. So you can listen to an audio book while you sand or you can listen to music while you sand. You know, it's got to be done, so you may as well enjoy it. Now that we've got the theory out the way, let's talk a little bit about what the alternatives are. If you don't have machinery, now, one of the best, in fact, I'm going to stick my neck out here and say this. The best sander on the planet is this guy here, yourself, your arms. You can get a much better feel by hand than what you can with a machine every time. So a good little hand sanding pad can do absolute wonders. In fact, very often I find that sanding stuff by hand, I get a better result faster than what I do by machine. Obviously, if it's a great number of things or big tables, then I'll use machinery. But very often, just a bit of hand sanding will do the trick. So you get all these different kinds of hand sanding pads. I find these ones to be great. This one is one where you can stick the pad on and you have the corners. So if you really, really want to work um, in corners, you can fold that around there. You've got your flat surface and you've got your corner surface. These are fantastic, and they're so inexpensive. I mean, they're not expensive at all, and they come in different sizes. So here's a round one, and this stuff is, uh, this is just such a pleasure to work with. It's easy to grip, the small one, the big one. But okay, so let's say you don't want to spend money on even that, but you had an old sander lying around somewhere, and for whatever reason, the foot of your sander got worn down. Now, this is what this is. I've just taken an old doorknob, and I've screwed it to the base of an old sander. When this guy gets worn out and he's not good enough anymore to hold the hook and loop paper on because this part's getting worn out, that's because there's so much torque and so much pressure on this pad that it spins it off because this is traveling at such speed. But your hand is not that. So it means you can take that and you can repurpose this and use this as a hand sander and it's actually a very comfortable little hand sander. Even if your friend's got an old sander, he's throwing it away. Just so before you do, I'll grab this bit over here. 
put some sanding pad on it or put a doorknob on it and you've got yourself a perfect little hand sander right there. If you are going to be doing shaping and sanding and stuff like that, then it's a good idea also to make something called a sanding stick. Now, these, a sanding stick is nothing more fancy than just a little piece of wood with sanding paper stuck to it. So there you go. There's my 80 grit sanding stick. And this can get into little places where you can't always reach. You can use it like a rasp or a file. You can shape things with it. If I want to get underneath something, I can sand that. So this is, these are great little pieces of kit. All this is, it's some sandpaper stuck onto a stick with a bit of glue. Make yourself a range of these. They really are immensely useful. You can buy sanding paper in strips for doing round work. Let's say I want to sand a leg of a chair and I can just use it like this instead of trying to get into those little corners all by hand. So there are so many different products available on the market. Here's even one. These are little profiles. So if I need to sand into a groove, I can wrap my sandpaper around here. It's a rubber profile. So I can do beads and coves um, all of, of all different sizes um, just with my sandpaper wrapped around them. So there's a gadget for everything nowadays. But you'll find a lot of the time just a good old hand sanding pad, some elbow grease and a bit of time, you can get fantastic results. Oh. Hmm. Uh-oh. Ah. <sighs>